Welcome, everybody. Here we go. Star Trek Strange New Worlds, Episodes 1 and 2 Review. So let's dig into it and, well, let's give a round of applause. All right, here we go. Let us kick off Strange New World. So can't couldn't wait for this uh, uh, series to kick off after the disappointment of Picard, the continuing disappointment of Discovery. Could we at least get some semblance of Star Trek back into the universe? Um, we launch it with the very first episode called Strange New Worlds, um, where Captain Christopher Pike, he comes out of a self-imposed uh, exile to rescue number one who has gone missing during a secret mission. Uh, we get introduced to, of course, the cast uh, as we start with. I'm going to pull the cast up and we will uh, kind of go through them here. Uh, all right. There we go. On the left, um, we do see we get Lieutenant uh, Uhura. I'm going to see if I can't blow this up. There we go. We get Lieutenant Uhura uh, on the left. Um, she's an interesting addition. She is fresh off of, uh, and she's a cadet. So she just got out of Starfleet. This was her uh, first posting. Um, so we get to learn uh, a little bit about her. Um, next we get um, Ortegas and um, uh, her name is Erica Ortegas. Um, very interesting uh, character. Not very Starfleet-like. I think that's going to be potentially one of my issues. She's issues. She's a bit of a of a loose cannon, very charismatic, um, but uh, her vernacular is not quite what you'd expect of a Starfleet officer. A way a bit like uh, Tom Paris, which was good, but at least they gave Tom Paris a reason behind it why he came in, how he got stuck into being on Voyager. We haven't gotten that yet with her and, and why she is the way she is, but hopefully it'll develop. Uh, Mr. Spock, um, the jury's out. I kind of like what how his portrayal of him in some aspects and not so much in others. So we'll find, uh, we'll find out as that continues. Next we get Hammer, who's the uh, Andorian. Um, he's an interesting addition. He's also blind or impaired, which they have an entire uh, part of an episode about about how humans consider themselves impaired, but Andorians don't. Um, Captain Pike, who's fabulous, he's just he he has all the makings of an incredible Starfleet captain. Um, so we, it'll be interesting to see how he progresses. Uh, number one, uh, Una Chin Riley. Um, you know, we haven't seen a lot on her on here, uh, so far, but hopefully we'll get a little more. Um, in the white, we have Nurse Chapel. Now, she's interesting because it doesn't fit into original Star Trek uh, canon. Um, Nurse Chapel in here is more of a specialist with alien uh, physiology, um, whereas in Star Trek, she wasn't even posted she was just a nurse but she was trying to find dr corbin her her significant other in the original uh, series and that's how she wound up getting posted onto the enterprise um later so she wasn't even there during this time frame so again it doesn't quite make sense so i'll be curious to see what they do to fill in the pieces with it um, and then we get Lan, Nuni, and Sin Sing, and yeah, I think it is going to be a tie-in to Khan, which, again, from a, a, a prime, you know, timeline, it doesn't really fit in and how they're going to try and do it. And then I guess the bigger question is why. She does have charisma. You can see this inner turmoil in her that... You know, she's nice on the outside, but she's got this fire on the inside. Uh, much like Khan was, you know, Roberto Montalban when he played him. So I'll be curious to see where they're going to go with her. Does she wind up being a traitor later in the series or not? Uh, anyway, an interesting one. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Mbenga, 
Um, again, doesn't fit well within the prime because he is from the original show, but he was um, Dr. McCoy's uh, assistant. Um, so it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense how why they're bringing him in like this. He was technically the assistant chief medical officer of the USS Enterprise under Captain Kirk, but he was under Dr. McCoy and he was learning. He Again, he dealt a lot with the uh, Vulcan. He had done some Vulcan training and stuff. So very interesting why they're trying to retrofit these characters into it. Maybe they're trying to piece things together because this is part of the Discovery timeline, which I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, so I, I will be curious as to you know, how that, all of that's going to play out. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to the uh, next one here. And I did want to kind of show you what the uh, Enterprise looks like. Um, I think this is a beautiful shot. It really is kind of from the first one. Um, the Enterprise with uh, Aston Mount Captain Pike on his horse. He's trying to escape. <clears throat> Pardon me. Just an absolutely beautiful shot. I will say right now, I thoroughly enjoy what they've done with the Enterprise. Um, I'm a huge ship fan, as most of you know, so I'm going to kind of show you some uh, stuff together. Um, you know, you, if you've seen my other ones, you've seen this is the Eagle Moss uh, version of it, um, and it is kind of uh, to scale. Um, and then we also have, and I'm going to pull it up here, uh, the er Enterprise that uh, Matt Jeffries made back in the uh, at, back in the '60s, and we can kind of see, get a, an idea of the comparison, the detail, what they've done with it. You know, there's actually like you know the hull plating that's on it, um, the the level of detail that went into it. But granted, with the technology today, you fully expect them to be able to do stuff like this. Um, this is just a beautifully done ship. It's much larger than what the uh, Enterprise, the original one, was. And that's okay since, you know, they're, they're retrofitting a lot of it. But, you know, the level of detail that they did both on the top and the bottom are pretty fantastic, actually. So this ship is very well designed. I absolutely love it. Um, this might be my second favorite ship, but let's just kind of compare it to the original one, which is the classic. Now, they didn't have the level of detail back there, but, you know, they didn't need to. The level of, of um, resolution in the TVs and such were that where you couldn't really get into that detail. It wouldn't show up anyway. You know, today it's it's quite a bit different in, in how they have to do it. This is still a classic and one of my favorites, and it was all always will be because it's the original. But honestly, between the, the two, they really did a great job of uh, changing um, of changing the ship. You know what I mean? Um what we are going to do is we're going to look a little bit at the inside right now. So let's take a look. This is what uh, the bridge was going to look like in when it was in showing up in Discovery. And it's a neat layout. Um, I really do like it. Um, uh, you know, even where you can see the panels and stuff on the on the back here. Um, I'm like, this is a well design. It's It's got to be set for the future. It looks more realistic in terms of of the future abilities. Um, but, and then here is a, a better picture of it where we can get in and see what it would look like uh, as they were actually filming it. So instead of the blue overtones, it's got a lot of the red overtones. Um, you can actually see the scanners uh, in the back when we blow it up and we're able to check around what they're, what they're doing. This is a beautiful uh, ship. I mean, the bridge where I know we're going to spend a lot of time here. So this has to be a focal point. How they lit up everything around here. It's bright. It's it, And it's effective. Um, it looks like it's utilitarian. So the design of this show is absolutely fantastic. 
I, I can't say uh, I can't say enough about that. So what we'll do is we're going to get into uh, uh, a little bit more dealing with uh, the characters. Um, episode one lays it out. Uh, you know they have to they wind up having a new encounter. They have to go rescue Nurse Chapel. Um, from these aliens. The Prime Directive doesn't exist yet, and that's what this one's all about. And it's General Order 1, how they don't want you to, you know, interfere <laughs> um, in the Natural Society Order, which we know is the Prime Directive, which it gets heavily into. Um, the whole dealings with Pike and Talos 4 from the original Cage episode plays a big part into this. You'll see him keep looking back into mirrors or reflections, and you can see he's in that uh, part where he's deformed and he's in that wheelchair permanently. He knows he knows the day he's going to die, which affects uh, certain things in the way that he processes things. Um, overall, you know, I like the storyline. Um, they jump in. They have to go rescue number one. They do. Um they kind of break the prime directive because they realize that this uh, they're going to destroy each other, this planet. They're going to go to war and basically wipe themselves out. Um, because of a problem, they developed uh, technology, basically created a warp bomb, which didn't really make sense from their telescope because they saw what happened on Discovery. So, you know, we were kind of created this problem, even though, again, scientifically wise, it couldn't have happened that way. So it's a bit of plot armor, but they move forward. Um, overall, the show you know, wraps it up. He, he, it goes around full circle when he's dealing with his 10 years to live, and he realizes he can use part of this to his advantage, and he shows them. We get a nice interaction. We get to meet some of the crew members. It's good. Um, it's a solid first intro, I thought, um, uh, into the show. I'm going to give the first episode a CGC rating of uh, 6.5. Um, it's beautifully done. There are a lot of things that I have questions on. Um, we'll see where they takes us. So now we're going to jump right into episode two, Children of the Comet. This one felt a lot more like Star Trek to me because it was just a standalone episode. Hey, there's this uh, um, comet. It's going to go crashing into a planet. And it's pretty cool. They're like, well, they, they simulate what it's going to look like. Again, the effects are fantastic. Smashes into the planet. Well, if we don't stop it, that's what's going to happen. It looks great. So they're, you know, they have different ways. They've done it in other episodes dealing with comets. Well, we're going to launch these uh, basically jets that will basically move, it, move the direction of it um, using the photon torpedo tubes. And it's cool. They launch it. You see it go in. And then that's where all of a sudden, boom, they hit. But the asteroid's got a force field. And Captain Pike's like, somebody want to explain to me why a force field is on an asteroid? And then they go into all of these theories. So it's an interesting quandary that one with a twist that we don't usually see. Um, and it becomes all of a sudden there's another ship there. They're protecting it. They must have been cloaked. We, they didn't really explain it, but all of a sudden the ship opened up fire and they were like, this is a bit where religion, um, where these are highly advanced zealots that go with the asteroid throughout space and they're there to protect it. Whatever happens, happens. This meets the scientific you know, federation. So we got religion versus science and they kind of go head to head. So I know you don't see a lot of religious overtones in the original ones because Gene Roddenberry wasn't big into bringing this in, but I thought it was an interesting uh, a mixture uh, when they went into it. Um, so they wind up having to beam down to the planet surface and, or I should say the asteroid surface. And this episode focuses on Uhura. And I, I thought it was very well done. They incorporate some of the great little things that they did with her from the original series. She was very musical. She would sing. 
they bring this out. The actress did a great job um, portraying her. I thought this episode was very solid in building her. We find out she actually didn't want to necessarily be part of Starfleet. She just felt with all of her loss that she kind of ran away to Starfleet. I think that was a great twist and uh, um, what they, how they're bringing her into this universe and what they're going to do with her. So good writing in that aspect. I really enjoyed it. Um, one of the things that really does, they have a great meeting in the captain's quarters. Now, here's one thing where it's a huge departure from the original series. You all remember seeing what the Captain Kirk's quarters was. You basically got the bed, a computer console, and a little bit of extra room. Uh, Captain Pike's quarters on the same ship is huge. I mean, it's like 10 forward. They actually have like a brazen fire that's sitting in there, kind of reminiscent to the Klingons on Discovery. Doesn't really make a lot of sense why there's that much room. Yes, it's the captain's quarters, but this is a military vessel. I mean, we don't usually get these kind of amenities until we got to the Galaxy class in the next generation. So they're really going overboard with having all this extra room. Um, and even the way that they address other officers and stuff like that, some of the hazing, it just probably wouldn't happen the way that they're showing it, according to the dialogue, the way that the Starfleet military regulations, at least throughout most of Star, the Star Trek, you saw the military code and how they operate, how they talk, and it was pretty standard to cross. You'd have like Paris or some of the other ones that were off a little bit. Um, but nonetheless, there was that decorum. For whatever reason, Strange New World, much like Discovery and unfortunately Picard, we have to be young and edgy. We have to swear. We have to do this. That's not Star Trek. And I hope they dial it back and just bring the vernacular back into more of the original uh, series. Um, cause you know, they, it was that way for a reason. And that's one of the reasons it was successful. That doesn't mean you can't have great characters. They just have to know how they're going to, uh, speak and iterate themselves. Um, we get, uh, we get introduced, you know, uh, uh Sam Kirk, which is James Kirk's brother. So we do get introduced to him. They wind up beaming down. They do some really interesting stuff, um, on the, um, Aster on the comet, and um, unfortunately, they can't beam him back when things go awry. And then Nurse Chapel winds up injecting them and into their ears, um, you know. And basically, she's like, You got two hours, otherwise, all this radiation it'll melt you. But they never come back to that, it's never. It's hardly an inconvenience after that. So again, they lay down this groundwork, which never really existed technology-wise anywhere in Star Trek. And then it's this big thing, and then they do nothing with it. So it had some big points, some pluses. This episode was pretty well written. It comes full circle at the end, where the you know Spock has to pilot the shuttle to try and divert it. And then it becomes, is this destiny? Is your future transfixed? Um, or are you able to manipulate the future? Or was this supposed to happen all the way around? So again, the vernacular wasn't my favorite, the way that some of the interactions were. Some of them were fantastic. Um, I really did like a lot of the interactions. So all in all, this story was actually pretty good. Um, I enjoyed it. I'm giving this episode a CGC rating of an 8.0. This felt a lot more like Star Trek. Single episode, let's get this all done. And it had a lot of the nuances of Trek. It's falling short in a few areas, but it's early on in the, uh, the series. I'm going to be curious to see where they go with it. You guys may have similar opinions. You guys may have completely different opinions, but... After you hit the like button, punch the subscribe button, leave your comments below and let me know the things that you love, you don't love. Give me your uh, CGC rating, uh, 0. 0.5 to 10.0, and let me know your thoughts. Can't wait to uh, hear from you. I'll probably continue to do these through this because this is 
a much better series already out of the gate than Picard or Discovery. So I'm anxious to see where they go, and I'm crossing my fingers. It just keeps improving. Like I said, leave your comments below, and we will talk to you soon. Live long and prosper, everybody.